to the book of Revelations tonight, chapter 1. Revelations chapter 1, wonderful presence of God here in your church. Amen. Revival's already here. I'm just trying to help you, amen, encourage you along in the things of God. Amen. Revelations chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 5 and 6. A uh, while back, there was an article that came out concerning uh, a famous gum wall in uh, Seattle, Washington. Somebody left this wrapper up here, man, so I must have the mind of God here, I hope. Amen. Over 20 years, <clears throat> people would take their gum and stick it on the wall. So for 20 years, they estimated that there's a million pieces of people's gum stuck on the wall. Six inches thick. Amen. It's going to cost the city four hundred thousand dollars to have somebody come in with a high pressure uh, cleaner, I guess, to blast it off of there. And no doubt once they do that, someone's going to start coming, putting the gum Ah, 20 years, like nasty gum. Church, you know, the devil likes to do that with us. He wants to make us feel defiled and dirty. And any little thing we do, man, he comes along with some gum and sticks it on us. And uh, well, we can't even look at ourselves without feeling condemnation. Church, the devil will condemn us. And when we battle condemnation, one of the things that will happen is we will lose spiritual momentum because we will stop to look at ourselves. Amen. That's very hurtful. I want to preach to you tonight about the blood of Jesus, a blood washed soul. And this is a weapon we have to use church because we are living in a day of defilement. Amen. You can't go anywhere without seeing something. You're not even looking for it. But there the devil goes. Mm -hmm. There you are again. Amen. And some come to church. Can't even lift our hands. Feel so oppressed. Feel so defiled. <clears throat> we need a blood washed soul tonight. So let's read this. <clears throat> Revelations chapter one, verse five and six. The Bible says this and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that's a very profound statement right there. Washed in his own blood. Verse 6. And made us, made us kings. Amen. And priests to his God and father to him. Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So let's look at this tonight. A blood washed soul. And I want to pray God's deliverance tonight to help us. First of all, I want to look at a need for a blood washed soul tonight. There's a song, no doubt uh, you sing it. Uh, I know we sing it in Prescott. Uh, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? But think of the word soul cleansing blood. Church, we're under the blood tonight. We're not defiled. We're not unclean because we have faith in the blood. It is the blood church that has the power to get into the soul. And a lot of us, we, they have what they call depth of soul. Uh, people that can write songs, poetry, David in the Psalms, uh, artists, these kind of folks. You could go in prisons and there are some guys, they can write pictures and draw pictures on their cell. And they're not even copying a book or nothing. It's in the soul. There's a lot of hurt in the soul, a lot of feeling in the soul. But church, it's in the soul where the blood needs to go. And when that blood gets in there, we're different. We're changed by the blood, not psychology, not, nothing like that. Simple faith in the blood. But that is the question. Are you washed in the blood? The Bible says this Proverbs 13 verse 20. There is a generation uh, that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. The Bible says, Luke chapter 11, verse 39. Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup 
and the dish clean. But your inward parts are full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones did not he who made the outside make the inside also. It'd be like going to a restaurant and all they did was cleaned maybe the outside of a cup. But on the inside of the cup is still filth in there. Here, you want to drink out of this? <laughs> Church, I mean, we're concerned about the inside. Amen. The inside down into the soul, down into our spirit. Many strongholds are in the soul. Amen. And, and so the Bible says some things to us. Sin is powerful. There are the deceptions of sin. Sin is an invader. It is a trespasser. It will get into the mind, the conscience. Every dimension of our personality will be invaded by this power called sin. When it gets in, we are not right. We're hurting really bad inside. The Bible says this in Titus verse 115. Watch the power of sin. It's an invasion. Amen. It's an active uh, uh, agent that gets in. But Titus said, whose minds and conscience are defiled. That means church contaminated. Right. That means there's they're dishonored. They're polluted. And again, church, our own conscience accuses us. Our own minds are filled with imagery because even words create an image. Words are powerful. And so we see here Genesis four, verse seven, the nature of sin. Remember this, the deception of sin, the deceitfulness of sin. There is a predatory nature in sin. When we play with it, we're releasing a powerful force in us. <clears throat> and we see God comes to Cain who had an attitude. Church, you ever get an attitude? It's deadly. It can lead to things, man. And Genesis 4, verse 7, and God is trying to help Cain, who hates his brother. So how many of us not supposed to be in the church? We're on the same team. Even Moses, when he saw, amen, the Egyptian and the Hebrew and, and he killed the Egyptian, what blew Moses away. The next time he cut and here are two Hebrews fighting. They're in bondage. The whole world hates them. And yet there's conflict between brothers, between sisters. And Moses is like, what is going on? I'm not saying that's here, but my goodness, we have a world who hates us. We need to love each other unto him who loved us. Right. But listen, so God tries to help Cain in his attitude. And Genesis 4, 7, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. This is an active demonic spirit. This is a predatory spirit. Amen. When we open that door, there is a demonic spirit that can get loose. Amen. And it's so crafty that it's knocking gently. It's playing with us. Amen. But it's deadly. It is. It is wicked. And Cain did not heed the warning of God. And he took his brother out to the field. Amen. And murdered him. And the Lord says, where's your brother? Can, is my, my brother's keeper? Church, we're all our brother's keeper. Every single one of us are to love each other, pray for each other, think the best for each other. We are our brother, sister's keepers. And the devil twists our minds and he can aim us against each other. And so he opens that door. <laughs> Demonic spirits in the church. There's a lot of backsliders today. Bound in rebellion, they have a wandering spirit, a vagabond spirit. They were in the house of God. They were saved. Church, I mean, a rebellion's a curse. And here we see Cain walking the earth with a mark on him, all because he disobeyed God. And so, in the book of Numbers, something interesting here. I can't read all this. Numbers five. Verses 11 through 31, it's about the law of jealousy. Church, our conscience, if it doesn't get washed in the blood, our own conscience can make us sick. And there's some facet here in our personality where we see a husband, and you can look at that if you want to. 
And this husband feels like his wife has committed adultery on him. He can't prove it. Amen. But he brings her to the priest. This is an interesting story. But they know how to get the conscience flared up. To bring a physical manifestation. We must get our conscience right. It will release things in us. In our physical bodies. And so they put her under an oath. And verse 18 there. The bitter water that brings a curse. Verse 21 makes you a curse. Verse 22 causes the curse to go into your stomach. Into your thigh. Listen. Even if she said I didn't do it. And said, okay, we want you to take this oath, drink this, and made her do the oath. Said, now, if you're lying to us, your conscience, man, by drinking this thing, it's going to affect your stomach. It's going to affect your legs. Amen. And just think, man, if she's hiding something, right? It'd be like, oh my goodness, I got to repeat this uh, and drink this. Her conscience will cause a physical manifestation. Her own conscience hurts her body. Church, we need the blood tonight. Amen. We can pray and pray, but if our conscience has been invaded by this active spirit that constantly accuses, then we get sick. Something now, that's not all right, but sometimes. And so let's move on. Second of all, I want to look, amen, at the purpose of a blood washed soul. In the text, it says this to him who loved us. Church, he must really love us to wash us in his own blood. This is just profound. It goes beyond our human understanding being washed in the blood. This is really deep depth of soul coming out of the scripture who washed us, uh, loved us, washed us from our sins. Church, your sin is forgiven. And it's because of the blood. It can come out of the conscience. It can come out of the memory. The body can be healed. Right. And so uh, it goes on and has made us. Kings church dominion is as we stay under the blood, stay under condemnation. We will not think we are kings. And then it says as kings are have authority. Church, how many don't have authority? No, I'm guilty. I'm not forgiven. I did horrible things in my life. I have failed. I'm ashamed. Church, we'll never be a king or have authority like that. The blood is to raise us up. And then it says, amen, uh, kings and priests. A priest is to have compassion. Church, people who are angry. I mean, angry. They're not washed in the blood. Their conscience must be accusing them and accusing them. Church, you ever met a miserable Christian? They have never felt God's love. They have never felt the peace inside their conscience, in their mind, in their spirit. And there's an anger. There's a deep bitterness. Church, the blood brings silence to that. The blood releases an understanding. You and I are loved. And that's just how it is, man. It's the blood that loves us, washes us. You are a king and you are a priest. You have authority and you have compassion. What a good balance. But if there's no compassion, is it because we still hate ourselves? We hate everybody, right? It's coming from here. The blood has power to bring that love and peace into our lives. Revelation, amen, the Bible says these words, 12, verse 11. Personal dominion as we stay under the testimony of the book. Not your good works, not my good works. That's not a good weapon. The only weapon that silences the devil is that blood. Amen. And so the Bible uh, says these words, 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood. Church, very basic, back to the blood. You can't work in fear. But I did this, Lord. The devil sees we're afraid. Those are dead works. Any works offered to God in fear, insecurity. So I don't want that. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to know you're covered, washed in your soul by the precious blood. You can get victory over the conscience. And we have done bad stuff. 
But that blood church is more powerful than any sin we have done. And we have done a lot right in our lives. And so we have to stay under. We they overcame by the blood of the lamb. There are demonic strongholds that are only broken by the blood. Think about this Egypt, <clears throat> all these demonic gods. Church, there was a battle going on there to get God's people free. I wish it was just one word, one supernatural manifestation. But Moses is going at it, but he's going at it with demonic powers, right? But you remember the first weapon that Moses used? God told him to go to the river. Amen. Lift, tell Aaron to lift up his rod and smite it. And what happened to those rivers, man? It turned to blood. The power of the blood church, everything in the river died. There's not one accusing voice that can live in your ear if you plead the blood. If you will smite it, if you will lift up the rod, amen, use the authority as a king. Amen. As a priest of God, you lift the rod. Church, when is the last time you realize I've been battling this condemnation? Amen. I've got no momentum. I don't feel right. Church, when are you going to smite it? Because there's all kinds of spirits running around right now. I feel what Pastor said. My goodness, church, I was in Brazil during this carnival. I'm like, what the world? Pastor and I were trying to go to this coffee shop. He was hooked on caffeine. No. <laughs> And, and, no. <clears throat> and, and so we get stuck right in the midst of this huge parade. And it was filthy, man. And I'll tell you a thousand times worse, whatever's going on here. But it was like, oh, my God, we're trying to plead the blood. We're stuck. Yeah, stuck. We ever feel like the devil make, has made you stuck right in the midst of wickedness. But the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard. You know, the standards, the blood. The blood church for us tonight anyway. And so he, he lifted that rod, struck the river. Everything died. I command church, the devil, the demonic voices to die right now. Church, any of you tolerating words spoken against you that make you feel like nothing? Will you smite it by the blood, only by the blood? By the blood that came out of the veins of the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Amen. We've got to smite this. The last, amen, thing that Jesus or God sent on Egypt was the blood on the doorpost. When I see the blood that you applied, there's where you apply the blood tonight. When I see that blood, you will not be judged. When you sin, confess it, forsake it. Amen. He is faithful to cleanse us, forgive us of all unrighteousness. Church, we've got a good advocate. We've got the best because he gave his blood for us. Stay under the blood. I believe in the blood. There's dominion there. You're not judged. That's good news. Living in this world. God, the blood. I plead the blood tonight. Maintain the testimony of the blood, we have to voice it out. The Bible says, Hebrews 12, 24, says Jesus' blood speaks better things than Abel's. You know, the blood of Jesus was saying, I want punishment on Cain. And God did, church, put a mark on that man, right? What is the blood of Jesus? It's better. Father, forgive them. The blood does not bring punishment. The blood brings love and redemption. We are justified, redeemed. Sure, we got a good Savior. What a wonderful Savior. There's no punishment. I know we got to work through some consequences, perhaps, but it's not this punishment that Cain God, I was reading today and I took a few notes because uh, it really interests me about the law of the Medes and the Persians. This is Daniel chapter 6, verse 8, verse 12, verse 15, three times. It mentions the law of the Medes and Persians. I don't know how many know what that is, but these folks were trying to get Daniel, scheming to dig, dig up dirt on him. Remember the story? And what they did with the king is, we want you to write a law 
And once you write that law, nobody can change it, can alter it, right? And this had to do with someone uh, seeking their God for 30 days. Daniel heard about this. Remember this? And he, man, he opened the windows, man. And he starts praying three times a day. So, there it is. We got him now. Did you ever feel like the devil scheming on you because of your faith? trying to find something on you to blame you in school, blame you in the city, what, on your job, right? And, and so they got Daniel. They said, King, you cannot change the law of the Medes and the Persians, right? You can't alter it. You're going to have to kill Daniel. Throw him in the lion's den. Verse 20, the king all night is worried for Daniel. He runs to the edge, I guess, says, Daniel, has your God whom you trust been able to deliver you from the mouth of the lion? Church, there is greater power than the law of the Medes and the Persians. It is God himself. It is God that rescues us. When the whole world is condemning, you say, you can't change your past. You can't change nothing. It's in the books. It's down at the police station. It's on public notice. It's on the record. Church, there is a law. It's God's law. It's the word of God that can break any law against you of your past. Our God is great, church. It is the word of God that sets us free. Daniel's down in the lines. Oh, man, take it easy, king. Everything's cool down here. God has shut the mouths of the lion. Church, it's the blood tonight that will quiet the devil. Amen. In many people's lives, the purpose of the blood is to give hope to anyone who's failed. <clears throat> In the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 14, it talks about the parable of the soils. And there's one in here that's interesting for the ones that fell amongst the thorns. Church, any of you still pulling those thorns out? We fell amongst the thorns. And even we who are saved, we've raised up kids. I have four kids, six grandkids, and I wish they were all saved, but they're not. I got one that's really fallen in the thorns. I mean, seriously, man. But I tell you what, man, I'm still believing God. And maybe you're there, too. But here's the interesting thing about the one who fell in the thorns is it's still there. The devil church, he will look at Christian dad and moms and grandparents say you raised up a kid like that you're not saved you're not a christian dad you're not a preacher you're not this so you felt that condemnation your kid turned out how and there is such a condemnation church a shame this relentless humiliation right like every one of our kids should be saying we're believing god but adam and eve fell too Right. The first kids. But how many parents church hang their head? Man, we have kids man, some are in prison. Grew up in church. Right. Things happen in life. Some of our kids have got into some shameful stuff and the devil reminds us a lot. Right. I mean, he reminds us. Right. Oh, you're doing good. But look what you raised. It's amazing, man. And so. They say, I read this teenage girls, number one reason why they commit suicide. These facts are always changing, but they put pictures on the Internet. They thought this was funny when it came out, I guess, you know, taking shots. And, and then other people actually putting pictures of them on the Internet. Right. I mean, just, you know, naked pictures, whatever it is. Right. And that's like, oh, that's kind of funny. But, you know, it's not funny after a while. And now they're realizing, hey, this is on there forever. Right. And many, this is a cause for incredible shame, realizing nothing, scrubbing that off the Internet. Many committing suicide because of this. I was not too far from here one time preaching revival. And uh, man, there's this uh, I, I gave a call for migraine headaches, man, just because I believe a lot of it's from unresolved conflict, not all. One lady came up immediately. She forgave her husband or something, got healed. <clears throat> Service was over and uh, we're leaving the pastor and I. And there's a teenage girl, man, kind of hiding, you know, full of shame. And uh, 
you could tell, man, there's something really bothering. She says she's got migraine headaches. She's young. And, and so we're asking her, do you know what's wrong? Is there something in the conscience? She says, yes, because I have a girlfriend. Now where I'm going. Right? And they think, these young kids, they think this is cool. It's not cool. It's demonic. And some of them are waking up to the shame of this. And so she's in this relationship. She, I know it's wrong. You didn't even have to really say it. It's in the conscience. Amen. And so we talked to her. I talked to her about the blood of Jesus, man. And she's crying because of the shame. There's a lot of shame in the soul. Even in those who have been around a long time. Can't break through. Can't get into the things of God. Can't lift our hands in prayer because we feel unworthy. You, ever, you know, the Bible talks about the one, the two in the temple praying. One guy couldn't even lift his eyes. You talk about shame, right? And so prayed for this girl. The pain left. Those tears turned to joy. The blood of Jesus, when someone believes, that shame, church, comes out of the soul. And that's a miracle. To reach into a human soul where there has been accumulating, whether that's the conscience, the will, all of that stuff we have, it's very, very powerful. There's a song. I mean, when I hear songs about the blood, I really listen now. But here's one you probably heard, too. The blood. <clears throat> sorry. That, that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength. This is the power of the blood. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. This is a wicked world every day. There's the blood that gives us strength in this world. Right. And goes uh, will never lose its power. The blood of Jesus never will lose its power. Wow. What a weapon. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears and uh, dries up all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Church, you believe that tonight? Oh, we ought to sing about the blood of Jesus. It does not lose its strength. That's the weapon of dominion church. In the Bible, it says they sing a new song in heaven. This song is going to go forever. Revelations 5 verse 9. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Church, they're singing it in heaven. Maybe right now. It's only by the blood. And they're singing this. Amen. Let's close. The Bible uh, applying the blood to our souls. Old Pentecostals way back in the day had two favorite songs. One is under the blood. And then the other one was the comforter is come. They said that they would sing about the blood for a while and then they would feel a cleansing wave come over the church, over the people of God. And after that cleansing wave came, it seemed to sweep over them and then proceeding, preceded by a wave of the spirit in power. Church, we're Pentecostals. It's the blood and the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost to be released. We must have the anointing church. Amen. And it is that blood that releases. And we've got to sing, believe and praise the blood and say, Holy Ghost, I am washed tonight. Amen. I am released from a past that's horrible. The Bible says, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit? You know, the Holy Spirit lives forever eternal. And you know what the Holy Spirit's trying to do right now is take that blood and apply it to somebody's soul. The Holy Spirit is working for us and the spirit of God. We're Pentecostals. We believe in the Holy Ghost to start moving, apply the blood. You lost your temper. You looked at this. You did that. You did this. I, I don't know. You spoke something you shouldn't have spoke. Let the Holy Ghost come and help you. He is the comforter. He's the helper church. But the helper can only help those who are humble and have humility. Church, we need God. And that helper will take the blood and put it over that sin and release it. Right. Oh, the helper, the Holy Ghost church. We've got to have this. Amen. <clears throat> Thank God for the blood tonight. Church, when the devil repeatedly attacks you about anything at all, 
Say, the blood. Shut up, devil. Sure, I like that story, man. That woman bent over for 18 years. Remember the story? Man, can you imagine 18 years bent over? When she looked, she had to look sideways to open a door. She had to, you know what I'm saying? 18 years. And Jesus said it was Satan who bound her. She's a daughter of Abraham. He helps her. He calls her. And she's probably looking and she's coming to him bound. Oh, the devil's on her back. We've got to tell the devil, get off my back. You've been riding me long enough. I make you say amen, church. Get off me. Through Jesus' name, she stands up. She's made straight. What would it be like to feel deliverance? Been bowed. Oh, I'm just not good enough. I want to come more. I want to get involved, but I just don't feel right. The blood. Tell the devil to get off you. Amen. And Jesus paid a price. The Pharisees, ah, you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. It's exactly what the Sabbath day was for. To bring relief and deliverance. Why we're here tonight. Amen. To bring a deliverance. Amen. Oh, we need the blood. Listen, a confession applies the blood. <coughs> First John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But watch this part, church. Uh, forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Every one of us knows what it is to feel defiled and filthy. If you put your faith in the blood, say so you leave here clean. Oh, the blood cleanses us. It washes church. It's powerful if we will confess as I'm getting ready to stop. Here's an atheist. And these folks are everywhere now. Amen. But I challenge this Christian. Say, I, do not, I do not believe that there is any power in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, I've been around for 2,000 years. And if there was any power, as you say or you claim, uh, the world would not be in such a starry state. The Christian said, sir, there's also a lot of soap around, right? And yet many people are still dirty. Soap does not make a person clean by just being around, not even if he works in a soap factory. If you want to know what soap can do, you have to take it and apply it personally. Then you will see this is how it is with the blood of Jesus. It's not enough to know about the blood. Church, one of the things that's making us very cold today, we got all the doctrine in the world. It's not about that. It's a personal relationship. It's a personal faith. It's not in a statue. We'll get dead that way. We'll get cold. This is personal. It's a personal faith in the blood. Amen. I heard about the blood, but we're not applying it. Oh, man. So you got to take it, apply it personally. Then you will see this is uh, how it is with the blood of Jesus. It's not enough to know about the blood. Sing about it. Preach about it. I now challenge you, sir. Apply the blood of Jesus to your sinful life. And you will join hundreds of millions of people all over the world who sing and say there is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Church, there is power tonight in this scripture. First Corinthians six, verse nine through 11. Think about this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, adulterers, so, uh, uh, idolaters, homosexuals, sodomites, nor thieves, covetous, nor drunkards, revilers. Amen. Extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. But watch this church. We're not self-righteous because watch such were some of you. Such was right. Amen. And then it goes, but you were washed. Feel good to be clean. You wa but you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus by the spirit of our God. Let the Holy Spirit work on us, church. You're sanctified. You're justified. Right. Sanctify the moment right now. Let God come into view. Let the cross and the blood. We got to sanctify the moment. Just the blood, the blood tonight. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.